Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. Today, we're going to take on the big topic of transparency. And I have two of my colleagues here today to help us do that. Cheryl Hughes is a principal in our law and policy group. And Faresh Dastiar is a principal in our data technology and analytics group. So as we think about transparency, the reason why it's complicated is because there are multiple rules to comply with. For starters, the hospital transparency rules went into effect of January of this year. Next, we have the group health plan transparency rules that impact employers, and those begin to go into effect January of 2022. And to make things just a little bit more complicated, the Consolidated Appropriations Act that was signed into law at the end of last year includes several requirements for health plans. And among those is a consumer cost comparison tool that is um, specified to go into effect in January of 2022. So a lot of moving parts as it relates to transparency. So to start off, Cheryl, Hughes, why don't you share with us exactly what employers are required to do to comply with its transparency requirement? Okay, so just honing in on the transparency and coverage rules, there are two basic requirements. One is for employers to post machine readable files beginning with the January 1, 2022 plan year and then also to post a self-service tool for plan years uh, beginning in 2023 for limited services and then in 2024 for all items and services under the plan. But back to the machine readable files, that's actually three separate files. They must all be publicly available. The first file is for negotiated in-network provider rates the second is for historic out-of-network allowed amounts and build amounts. And the third is for negotiated rates and historic net prices for prescription drugs. So this is information, much of it we have not seen before. It's been in, within a black box and has not been available to our clients, uh, much less the public. But again, this is to be made available to the public. Again, that is for the 2022 plan year for all covered items and services under the plan. The self-service tool is not for the public, that is for participants in the plan, and it's designed to provide a lot of information that is personalized to the participant who is using the tool, and it requires the tool, the rules require the tool to provide upon request and in advance an estimate of cost-sharing liability and a lot of other information also including negotiated rates um, for specific, for at first specific covered, and item, covered items and services under the plan, again for 2023, and then for 2024, all items and services under the plan. Uh, for 2023, we just have 500 specific listed services. Um, this is intended to be posted on an internet website uh, and provide real time responses. So it has to be updated uh, real time. The machine readable files, on the other hand, have to be updated monthly. So there is quite a bit of information for employers to understand and, you know, start getting ready to comply with. So, you know, listening to you refer to the black box of data elements, it made me wonder if there are some data issues for employers and the insurance companies to work through. And so, Foreshta, how complicated is it going to be for employers to get access to the data required for transparency? Yes, uh, right now it's quite complicated because there are strict guidelines in place today with NDAs. And the NDAs actually block the fields that Cheryl was describing now have to be a part of this transparency ruling. So those fields like build amounts, negotiated rates, provider information, that is in the black box today. We're not able to see that. So um, these NDAs are blocking those fields and employers really should be looking at their NDAs they have in place today with their carriers 
And in addition, look at the NDAs they have in place with any other third party vendor, because they're all going to be affected by this transparency ruling. Wow. So that signals to me that we're all going to be opening up contracts and having to renegotiate those before we can even talk about getting the data. So there's some work to be done there. You know, the question that I get asked the most, Cheryl, that I'm going to direct to you is, who does this rule apply to? Yeah, Tracy, um, the, the rules apply to all non-grandfathered group health plans and insurance carriers. It will, the rules do not apply to retiree-only plans. The rules do not apply to health reimbursement arrangements or HRAs. They do not apply to health flexible spending accounts or FSAs. They don't apply to health savings accounts or HSAs, but they do apply to the high deductible health plan or other group health plan that is associated with that account-based plan. The rules do not apply to accepted benefits like dental or vision. The rules do not apply to expat plans and they don't apply to short-term limited duration insurance. I also just want to point out that the rules apply a little differently to insured plans versus self-funded plans from the employer's perspective. So if the employer is sponsoring a fully insured plan and they agree with the carrier that the carrier will provide the compliance for transparency, then the employer is not going to be responsible for the transparency compliance. But for any self-funded plan, an employer may contract with a vendor to help them with this compliance, but they will still maintain liability for compliance with, with these rules. So we've, we've been looking at our uh, clients and different employers with these, with these rules and seeing them in three categories. The first is the fully insured plan. That's a little easier to comply with from, from an employer's perspective. Then we have the self-funded plan, an employer who maybe sponsors only one self-funded plan. That's a little more complicated because they're going to maintain responsibility for compliance. But then we also see and work with a lot of employers who have multiple point vendors or carve-outs for behavioral health or carve-outs for prescription drugs or multiple, multiple plans that are self-funded and maybe they have some insured plans as well. So that third category, you know, becomes very, very complicated for employers. So that's a really interesting point about the employers that have multiple partners that they're doing business with, because they could conceivably be getting a different file from each one of those vendors, the machine readable file and the consumer um, file as well, the consumer tool. And so one of the things to bring up is that um, first and foremost, you know, we barely had a year's notice to get ready um, to comply with these requirements. And so, you know, that implementation for 1-1-2022 might just be a little clunky. Um, but in terms of employers thinking about their partners, um, clearly your insurance company partner is one to work with on this. You may have a standalone transparency tool um, through a third party vendor, or maybe you have one through your carrier that could be um, modified in order to meet these requirements. There's a lot of different scenarios that could play out. And you know, one of the potential partners could be your data warehouse vendor. And so um, Fareshta, give us an overview of what's going on in that space with the data warehouse vendors. Yes, Tracy, that's right. There are, that is an avenue of, of consideration. We've been speaking with various data warehouse vendors, and there's a broad spectrum of different responses from them. Some of them are still trying to understand what does this really mean. They're still in the initial, initial phases. Then you have others that have a team in place to think through what this means. They don't have a plan in place yet, but they have a team in place to think through what this means. And then you have others that already have a tool in place. Um, as an example, IBM Watson already has a tool that they use on the provider side. It's called the Treatment Cost Calculator tool. And that's in place today. They've had it for a while and they use it for providers. They would need to tweak that and make that employer friendly. So they're still working on how's the best approach to get that done. 
Um, and then the other consideration with data warehouse partners is that some of these data warehouse vendors have a direct relationship with these carriers. So as an example, HDMS has a direct relationship with Aetna and CBS. And then Optum Insights has a direct relationship with UHC. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, I know we're going to be continuing to have conversations with these data warehouse vendors as they're progressing through thinking through how they're going to impact this role. So that's super helpful. So as I think about the conversation that we've just had, a good place for employers to start would be first with an inventory of your plans that are in place today that are going to have to comply with this. And then second is to um, get your contracts out and take a look at them to see what kinds of provisions are in there for data sharing that might need to be updated. Um, so that is really a good place to start. So Cheryl and Foresta, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank all of you for tuning in to Mercer Health News. We'll see you next time.